together, even with our masks on. So we expect a wonderful time with Stephen. But I have to remind you, Stephen. Um, yes, I have to remind you to stay in your seats until you are ushered out and to take the service sheets with you. Um, we also have some sad news and that lovely Jim Smith that has been coming with us worshipping for some years has died this weekend. So we think I've hit, hit this family in particular. And with that, I will welcome Ian. This is great. And we are looking forward to the rest of the day. It is good to be with you this morning and to be able to worship together. It's, there is something different about being able to be together in the presence of God. And yet our togetherness is not just with those of you gathered in the building. It is with those of you who are watching on the, the, on the live link and uh, those who will be watching over the week. So welcome to all as we come to worship our great and glorious God. And we should be thinking this morning about the greatness of God. It's Trinity Sunday today, um, one of those ones where most preachers try to get off the plan, but um, we shall be thinking about the greatness of God this morning. And so we're going to uh, hear him. Those of you at home have the advantage over us that you can sing as you go along. But we're going to sing one of the modern uh, songs, From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, indescribable, all-powerful, untamable. That is our God. And so we hear that music play for us.
But God, you are indescribable, uncontainable. Our words cannot reach to the grandeur of your being. Our minds cannot contain you. And yet we dare to come this morning to worship you and to pour out our lives before you. We dare to come into the presence of Almighty God, the God who has created heaven and earth, the God who has placed the stars in the heavens and brought order out of chaos, the God who has shape things with your wisdom and fill the universe with your goodness and your purity. And so we come today to bow down before you in worship, to offer our lives to you, to offer all that we are to you and to just be in your presence and to know the wonder of your being. Lord, you have shown us in creation your power, your majesty, your beauty, your wonder. You have shown us in your care for your people that you are the God of unending love. You have shown us that you are a God of wisdom, whose wisdom guides and leads all that happens on earth. You have shown us that you are a God of amazing purity and holiness. And as we come to worship, we recognize our own lack of holiness. We recognize our failures to speak as we should speak to others. Our failures to love as we should love towards other people. Our failure is to take risks on you and to follow where you call. <laughs> Lord, as we stand as we are with our failures and the mess that we've often made of our lives, we wonder whether we can continue to stay in your presence. And yet in Jesus Christ you have reached down to us and have walked this earth with us. You have lived where we live, walked where we walk, spoken as we speak, seen as we see. And you have reached out in love to us. When we could not reach to you, you have come to us. And we praise you for Jesus. But we praise you also that day by day you continue to be with us. As we open ourselves to you, to your Holy Spirit, you live with us and empower us for new life. And so, Lord, although we are ashamed of our past, we live with the hope of what you will do with us and through us in the future. And so we come and we offer you our praises and our worship in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Marjorie is going to read the first of our readings today, which comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. It's one of those passages which you'll be very familiar with if you've been in church regularly, and uh, it's one of those passages which just speaks of Isaiah coming in to the temple, coming into the place of worship, and meeting with God in all his awesome majesty, with all the, the company of heaven with him. And so we're going to hear that passage.
from Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah's Commission In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So we're going to sing again as we remember that story of Isaiah and the, the seraphim and cherubim crying out to God as we sing number 11, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee, obviously written for a 9.30 service at Midsummer Lord since it's early in the morning.
reading verses 15 to 21, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Amen. Thanks to Marjorie for reading those lessons for us. A couple of weeks ago, I found myself teaching my granddaughter physics. She is only seven. And to be more accurate, what we were actually doing was playing on the seesaw and seeing how close to the middle I had to get before her weight could lift mine. But I knew it was about physics, really, and it was basics. Of, and I seemed somewhere in the dim and distant Past of my memories to remember something about moments around a fulcrum or something like that. Someone will no doubt put me right. But I have to say that my grasp on physics is not the most brilliant. If you gave me a book by Stephen Hawking, I would probably get to page three and then either be asleep or put it aside because I didn't understand it. <laughs> but what gets worse is when you get into this area that they now call quantum physics. It's the sort of physics where my mind, I'm afraid, goes into an absolute spin and I know that I might never recover from the mess that it's making inside me. The only thing I can remember when someone did try to give me a clue about quantum physics was that there was an experiment when they showed that a particular particle could be in two different places at the same time. Now you see my, my, my mind starts to boggle a bit at this. It sounds a wonderful solution to those times when I double booked myself and not into my diary. But I'm afraid my tiny brain can't quite grasp how one thing can be in two places at the same time. It frankly doesn't make sense to me or my way of seeing the world around us, but the physicists tell us that that's how it is. Or maybe a picture may help you. We're going to have a picture on the screen in a moment. And I want to ask you what you see. Or no, don't answer because you're not meant to, are you? <laughs> you may see, and I think what most people see as the first picture, is an old gentleman with a sort of military uniform on and a big beard. If you look again at it, you will notice also that there's a man and a woman and a dog. Two pictures in the same picture. Two pictures there at the same time. And actually, normally, once you've got one picture in your head, it's very difficult to move to the other. And it certainly, I think, is impossible to keep both pictures at the same time. So is it surprising when we come to look at the nature of God, the God who created the world that includes two images in one picture, the God who creates quantum particles that do unbelievable things. Is it surprising that we struggle to describe God in words? Is it surprising that we can't encapsulate everything about him? And that sometimes we finish up using words that seem totally illogical. This Sunday is Trinity Sunday, when we think of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we say that there are three persons, but 
there was really only one. And the moment we start down that line, we find ourselves affirming things that seem impossible, like one plus one plus one equals, well, one. I can actually prove it mathematically, but that's not a matter. Or we affirm that Jesus is both holy human and holy God. How can that be? Surely the word holy excludes those, that's words. And we find theologians tying themselves in all sorts of knots to explain it. One of the creeds of the church has these wonderful words in it. It says this, the Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Spirit incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. And also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. And as one person rightly said, the whole thing is down and down in incomprehensible. How can you believe that lot? And we tie ourselves in knots trying to describe God. And people will then challenge us and say, how can you believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? But if a, a physicist can tell me that a single particle can exist in two places at the same time, why is my belief in God? as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So difficult. The physicist describes what is before them as they do their experiments. The Christians describe how they experience God. We are describing what we know of God. When Paul writes about the grace of Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship in the Holy Spirit, he's not into impossible theology. He is simply saying to his readers, this is how I experience God. The early Christians, like all their fellow Jews, knew the awesome power of the Creator God, who filled heaven and earth with his presence. But also as they walked and they talked with Jesus, in the ordinary world they knew that somehow they were in the presence of God. And that disciple who we so often accuse of being doubting Thomas, kneels before the risen Jesus and says, my Lord and my God. Because that's how he experienced it. Close to him and yet almighty God. And those same disciples went on to know a power and a comfort and a presence with them as they faced a difficult future. A being who somehow empowered them, who somehow transformed them, who encouraged them. And they knew that this was the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. That was what they experienced. And normal language just didn't work when they tried to put all that experience together. What they just said is, this is how God is. This is how he relates to us. And if we deny any one of those ways, then our God will be too small and we will be weakened. Now, of course, there have been times over the Christian history where we've done exactly that. Look back at the old Methodist hymn book and see how few hymns there were 80 years ago about the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly we rediscovered the Holy Spirit. And one writer was forced to write a book in the 1970s called The Forgotten Father. Because he said, we've we got big on Jesus and the Spirit, and we've forgotten the Father. And there have been times when Jesus has been reduced to the status of a mere human teacher. Now that's understandable. When you look at that puzzle picture, some will more often see one of those images than the other. And so with all of us. There are people for whom the nature of God as Father, or the nature of God as Jesus, or the nature of God as Spirit, will apply more often to them. They'll find that easier. But the moment we lose, one or other of those, then we are weaker. So let's look at all three very briefly. That reading from Isaiah is so strange with its cherubim and seraphim with their six wings, and it's not often that you walk down the high street in, in um, Midsummer North or wherever you are at the moment and meet a strange being with six wings. We're not into cherubim and seraphim very much in our normal life. But actually the center of the vision that Isaiah has is not those who serve God in heaven, but God himself. 
And it's a picture of God full of power, full of awesome majesty, full of total purity, full of knowledge, full of understanding. And when Isaiah sees God that way, he is overwhelmed. Have you ever had one of those experiences where you just feel full of elation because of the glory that you're seeing around you, but also feel so tiny and insignificant that you feel you could be crushed? Probably now about 20 years ago that I visited Victoria Falls and had one of those moments. The sheer power of water just dropping, the mist rising, the, the sound. Everything in that moment was almost too much to take and then you wanted more of it. It was overwhelming and yet you couldn't move. That's what Isaiah is experiencing in the temple. That's what Isaiah does as he sees God. Let me give you a, a very large number. Those rich physicists I started with reckon that there are between 100 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy. And that our galaxy is one of up to 2 trillion galaxies in the universe. Now that gives you a figure for the number of stars of something with 23 noughts after it. <coughs> no wonder that Isaiah felt a bit gobsmacked when face to face with the source of all that life and energy in the universe. But that is our God. Terrifying in power. Amazing in wisdom. And if you lose that from your image of God, you make him into a sort of all nice and chummy sort of person. If we live with that, we are fooling ourselves about the nature of God and we are living with only a tiny fraction of his reality. The Jews didn't dare to believe they could look at God face to face. The prophet Ezekiel had a vision of God when he was in exile, and he tells us that what he saw was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He didn't see the Lord. He didn't even see the glory of the Lord, not even the likeness of the glory of the Lord, but the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And even at that distance from God, he falls down in awe. Lose the awe. Lose the sense of the majesty of God. Lose the sense of the power of God. And you have a domesticated God. In the Narnia Chronicles, there's a conversation between Susan and Mr. Beaver about Aslan the lion, who represents God in the books. And suddenly, Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion. The lion. The great lion. Who says, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he, is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, Mr. Beaver said. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Lose the Isaiah vision of God and you render God safe but also so, so limited. And yet awesome power can paralyze us because we, we are afraid of doing the wrong thing. Overpowering wonder can leave us unable to, to meet with a God who is so other and so different from us. One of the questions I can remember being asked when I was young was, what famous person would you like to meet? I can't remember who I chose. But I'm sure that if my wish had been granted, actually I would have been so tongue-tied because there would have been no point of common ground. They would have been so great out there. Where is the point of reference between us? But the God of the 23 Norths stars is the God who comes in Jesus, lays aside his majesty, walks where we walk, experiences from the inside what it is to live on this tiny planet, God chooses deep, intimate relationship, chooses to relate to our everydayness. Jesus, in that reading from John's Gospel, talks of the love 
between him and his friends. If all you do is fear God, you will not love him. You will not love if there is no point of contact. You will not love if you are face down in awe all the time, unable to look the beloved in the eyes. The God we worship is not a God out there, but a God close by. God the Son brings us face to face with the invisible, awesome God. And he binds us to himself in love. Lose that, and you lose the heart of our faith. You lose the possibility of relationship with God. And yet the disciples also discovered another new reality, that there was a power at work in their lives that transformed them from within, that enabled them to do what they thought was impossible. They searched the scriptures to explain that power, and from the prophets they discovered that this, this was the Spirit of God, the Spirit who had moved over the face of the formless mass at the beginning of creation, the Spirit who had worked through the history of God's people. Without this experience of God, they might have loved Him, they might have worshipped Him, but they needed that power then to serve Him and to do what He wanted. They discovered that the power that shaped and formed those 23 noughts stars was at work in their lives, and that by His power they were given wisdom to see and strength to fulfill God's purposes. The reading of many Christians read last Sunday speaks of the transformation of the disciples of Pentecost as they were enabled to proclaim the great things God has done, to proclaim what God wanted, and then to be able to go out and do it. They heard and knew what they had to do, and they experienced the awesome power of God deep within. This was the God of the first disciples awesome and powerful, close and relatable, dwelling within and empowering. And this is the God of Trinity. And if we lose any one of those aspects of God, we will be living with only a part of God. A God close to us, but not one you can stand in wonder before. A God of immense power but who doesn't relate. A God who demands discipleship but never enables his people to fulfill what he asks. Where in that spectrum of things is your understanding of God? Are all the aspects of God present when you worship? Are all the aspects of God present when you pray? Or is your God somehow small? Because I fear that so often we believe not in the whole of God, but in part of Him. And our failure to grasp the wholeness of God has meant that the church hasn't fulfilled its call. Last week I was hearing figures about the decline of the Methodist Church. And the figures aren't working. But is it because we haven't truly believed in God as He really is? If when people joined us in worship, they were bowled over by the presence of God, I reckon they'd be lining up for more of that. We can obsess about numbers, but we should be concerned that we're presenting only a bit of God. And for individual Christians who find themselves struggling with life and discipleship, is it because we're trying to live it using our own resources? to fill in for the bits of God that we haven't remembered are there. And the problems of the world that confront us day by day, wouldn't they be transformed, not, not taken away, but transformed, if only people could see the fullness of God? The mathematics of the Trinity may be as mysterious as quantum physics is to me, but the reality is not. He is God the Creator, Father of all that is. He is Jesus who comes near. He is the Holy Spirit who enables us to do far more than we ask or can imagine. 
Our vision of God is often too small. But the reality of God is utterly amazing. And if only we could recapture our grasp on that vision of that Isaiah had, on that relationship with Jesus, on that spirit dwelling within, we would see the church and our lives, and actually far more important, the whole world transformed. This is the God we serve. Let's serve no lesser God. Amen. So now let's pray for the world that God loves so much. Father, we come into a world that so often seems full of darkness and problems and difficulties. And Father, in this moment we bring that world before you. and seek to know what you want us to do in it. Father, we pray for those places where coronavirus is still rampant. And we remember especially the people of India at this time, where the health service seems to be creaking and breaking, where so many families are being left bereaved and frightened. Lord, come into that land and by the generosity of your people bring the resources that are needed and by your challenge to those who are rulers transform that land once more. Father, we remember those places in our world where warfare and violence reign. We remember the people of Mozambique still living under the threat of Islamist terrorism. Father, into that place, bring your power and might. Transform hearts and minds to the ways of the Prince of Peace. Father, we pray for the communities in which we live and work day by day. We pray for those people who are struggling with unemployment or fears of what the future holds. For those within our community who are suffering from long COVID. For those in our communities who have lost loved ones and who continue to mourn. And we pray that by the comforting presence of your Holy Spirit, you would give strength to those who feel weak, that you would give hope to those who have fallen into despair, that you would bring healing to those who are sick, and comfort to those who mourn. And Father, at this time, we pray for those we know who need our prayers. We remember Anthony in his illness and ask you to be with him. And we pray especially today for the family of Jim Smith. Be close to them in their sadness. May they glory in all that has been good and rich in Jim's life. And may they know your presence beside them bringing them your peace and your hope of resurrection life. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. Refresh in us the vision of your being, that we may see you as you are and serve you in all that we do and are. Help us to hear your challenge who will go for us? Who shall we send? And help us with courage, Lord, to say, here we are. We will trust in you. And 
we will serve you. And so, Lord, we offer ourselves to you. And with ourselves, Lord, we offer those gifts that we have brought this day, praying that they may help others to know the wonder of your being and to meet you, the true and living God. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So our final hymn, a hymn which is based on that reading from Isaiah, I the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. Number 663.
ಡೈರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಲೈವಲ್ಲಿ ಇರು